that's creative than Taco Bell. I mean, how many times can you reinvent the taco, right? <laughs> but they have. You got the French toast chalupa. You got the Cheeto burrito. You got the Frito burrito. And one of my favorites, the Kit Kat chickadilla. And by the way, nacho fries. And by the way, they just entered the chicken wars, the chicken sandwich wars, with the chicken sandwich taco, right? So they're pretty creative. You keep going down, you got black. That's for your market leaders. They tend to be the classier brands. That's why you see Apple and Disney and Nike. And then at the bottom there, you have blue. Blue tends to elicit trust, dependability. And if you look at some of those logos, of course you want your healthcare to be blue, right? Pfizer, you want to make sure those vaccines are safe. When it comes to Ford, think about that, Ford tough, Ford dependent. And when you look at Boeing, you want to feel safe when you get onto a plane. So the point is, all of these have messages as well. And that's why I tell my team all the time, we have to dig deeper into the markets to even look at the emotional and sediment side of the markets. I always tell them, I don't want to read the headlines, I want to write the headlines. And that's what we're going to talk about, some of the data that we have underneath of what we do to help you see what's going on in the markets. First thing I want to talk about is just a little bit of a backdrop of what's happened and how significantly we've changed. I mean, if you look, 12 months ago, you remember that, right? You saw the worst quarter of GDP ever. It was down 30% at annualized pace. You saw terrible earnings, the third worst quarter of earnings ever. And if you look at some of those headlines up there, 46 states actually put into effect lockdown measurements. You saw the worst month of consumer confidence dropping in history, and you saw in one month 20 million jobs lost by the economy. That's never happened even close to that. And you can see the pictures. They pretty much spell what we saw. You saw barren streets, you saw closures, and you saw, if you could, people working at home. But fast forward to today, and what do we got? The economy there on the top left. The economy has recovered all of its lost economic activity, and once again is back at all-time record highs. When you look at earnings, not only has corporate America recovered the lost earnings, we are at least 14% above where we were pre-pandemic. And when you look at those pictures, full stadiums, people going back to the theater, children back in school, people going to restaurants, and us having a conference here, right? We are getting closer and closer back to normal. Now, when you hear people talk about peak, and it's almost like peak everything, everybody says, wow, that's terrible, right? We're at the peak. It can't get any better. But I would tell you that if you just take the word peak out of some of these, you still have a pretty good environment out there for investors. If you take out the word peak for monetary policy, just keep in mind the Fed is still going to remain accommodative, probably not raising interest rates until 2023. When you look at reopening, sure, we're not reopening as fast as we were, but we are still getting closer and closer to returning back to normal. And when it comes to fiscal policy, we're still getting some. We're on the cusp of getting that infrastructure package uh, signed, and we're likely going to get an additional $1.75 trillion when it comes to the social infrastructure. So fiscal policy is still supportive. If you take out the word peak on these, it may not be as good, but it's still above average, right? We're not going to be at peak earnings because we had that this year with earnings growth of 45%. But next year, we think earnings for the S&P 500 is still going to be around 10%. That's above the historical average. GDP growth, we think this upcoming year, 2022, is still going to be double what's considered a good year. And when you look at equity appreciation, we still think you're going to see upside next year of around 8 to 10%, and that's above the historical average. And then when you look at some of these peaks, it's actually very good news for the market. I think that we are past those peak inflationary scares. I think we are getting past the peak supply constraints. And I think we are past the peak when it comes to COVID as we return closer to normal. Now, when you look at the economy, probably the biggest game changer has been with COVID. And if you listened yesterday on the Sunday show, Scott Gottlieb has said it again. He thinks we are transitioning from a pandemic to an endemic, which means it's not going to be as big of an impact on our economy. In fact, if you look at the chart there on the top right, we do a survey every single quarter, and our investors have now dropped COVID from the number one concern by far coming into this year. It now ranks as the sixth biggest concern 
and it continues to fall. In fact, 70% of the people that, that answered the survey said that they don't believe that COVID is going to interrupt the economy going forward. And then what's even more important, if you look at the bottom right, every time we do the survey, we continue to see more and more people returning back to those normal conditions. In fact, if you look at the chart right now, 85% of the people that were surveyed said that they are returning back to work. 81% say they're going to restaurants. 75 are now willing to get back onto a plane. We are getting closer and closer every day to returning it back to normal. Now, when it comes to the economy, about two weeks ago, GDP growth came out. And it was weak for the third quarter. It was 2%. But I got to tell you, that is old news. Third quarter GDP, do you know what months that includes? July, August, and September. So that number was reflecting what you all were doing during the 4th of July. That's old news, right? That's why we really don't rely on those numbers that come out like GDP. We rely on what we call our super six real-time high-frequency data points because it tells us how the economy is doing today. And when you look at these, all six of them continue to point to increasing momentum for this economy. My favorite one, by the way, is up there right now. It's withholding taxes, right? So every single week, businesses have to collect all of our holding taxes, withholding taxes, and write a check to the government. And the government tells us how much they're collecting. Right now, you can see on that chart, it is at an all-time record high and it's increasing 14% year over year. What does that tell me? I don't even have to watch the employment numbers. I know there's either more people working or they're making more money. But the bigger part of that is that the US consumer has more money to spend. Job, so that's a check. If you look at the next one, initial jobless claims, it comes out every single week. It continues to trend lower and lower. It's at a post-pandemic low. Again, that tells me that businesses are hiring and employment conditions are healthy. So consumer confidence should remain healthy. We look at new orders for the ISM. So this is an index for the manufacturing component of the economy. And we focus on a little sliver of the report that comes out, and it's called new orders. Why? Because new orders are a harbinger of what's going to happen. And right now, those orders are at a near record high level. And then we do a little focus on the consumer. And for that, we look at credit card spending, and you can see that just continues to surge. Why? Because consumers are confident. They feel pretty good about their situation. So that's a positive. And that's confirmed by what we call mobility indicators. And you probably see a host of these. We look at a bunch of them from people going to restaurants, movie theaters, driving around. And this particular one, people going through the airports. It is at a post-pandemic high and is within an eye shot of actually recovering back to pre-pandemic levels. And then finally, Banks are confident. By a record amount, banks are easing their lending standards, meaning it's easier for you to get a loan. Why would a bank do that? Because they're comfortable that you and I and businesses are going to be able to repay their loans. And that is at near a record high as well. So when you look at all six of these, it points to an acceleration of economic growth. Make no mistake, this economy is consumer-led. You and I are leaders. We represent 71% of the economy. That's up from 65% back in 2000. So we by far are the biggest drivers. And the good news is that the cash flow that's accruing to consumers is tremendous. I mean, look up here. First of all, job creation. For the upcoming year, consumers are gonna have $280 billion just by the new jobs being created. And we forecast on average between 400 and 500,000 jobs a month for the next 12 months at the average salary, which is around $50,000, that gets you $280 billion. For the rest of us that have jobs, it's expected that wages are going to go up by about 4%. We're all gonna get raises. And that, by most economists, is considered conservative because right now it's actually higher than that. But if you apply just a 4%, that's an additional $460 billion that all of us are gonna have to spend. For retirees, Social Security had the biggest increase in their COLA adjustments since 1982, up 5.9%. That gives retirees another $90 billion to spend over the next 12 months. And then if you look at all the record amount of excess savings that are in all of our bank accounts, it's a little over $2 trillion. We conservatively expect that only 20% of that will be spent. That gets you another $400 billion. When you add all that up, 
you're talking about all of us, in addition to what we were already doing, spending an additional $1.25 trillion, which should continue to power this economy. When it comes to inflation, by far and away, it is the biggest topic that I get from clients. And you can see the headlines up there. If you look at the chart there on the right-hand side, if you go to Google, it is one of the most searched terms on Google right now, inflation. But I think the biggest question that people have to ask is, what does transitory mean? Because everybody's talking about it. And from the very beginning, we have defined transitory as inflation would peak during this quarter that we are in right now, early next year, and then ease or fade as we go into next year. That's how we define transitory. The other thing that's very important to differentiate is the difference between the level and the rate of change. So when I say inflation is going to ease, that doesn't mean it's going to fall. Prices aren't going to fall. It just means that the increase from where the level is today is going to slow. Now, I teach a class at Loyola University, and I got to tell you that if you think hyperinflation is ahead of us, then we're going to have to write a lot of the financial textbooks out there. And the reason for it is that there are three dynamics that continue to keep inflationary pressures low. The first one is technology. And just as an example up there, back in 1972, that HP computer, which by the way weighed 300 pounds, cost $95,000. Today, the desktop costs $290. The difference? It's 99% cheaper and 30 million times more powerful. That brings prices lower when you can do more and more with a computer. Second, rising globalization. Globalization is not going anywhere. Did the tariff wars reduce global trade? No, it went to a record high. Are these global supply chains leading to a reduction in global trade? No. This quarter, it's going to be another record high. Next year, it's projected to be record highs. Corporate America is not going to stop globalization. You may see the headlines that some places are, some companies are moving things from China to Vietnam, Vietnam to Mexico, but that's all just a, a way for them to find where's the least expensive, most efficient place to make their goods. So I don't think globalization is going anywhere. And then the third factor is something that we call the frugal consumer. And if you don't believe in the frugal consumer, then you don't believe in the fact that everyday low pricing, the rise of the discount retail chains, online shopping, all of that is done because of lower prices. And I got to tell you, consumers have a cost consciousness about them. They're not going to pay elevated prices. In fact, in that study there on the left-hand side that was done by Morning Consult, consumers today that haven't made a purchase, the number one reason why they're not making a purchase right now is because prices have gone too high. They're starting to balk at those high prices. In fact, if you look at the University of Michigan survey, they do a survey every month, and, it, and the question is very simple. Is now a good time to buy a house or a car? Pre-pandemic, that number was at 70% of people thinking now's a good time to buy a house or a car. Today, that number's down to 30%. So I'm telling you that consumers are starting to balk at those high prices, and when you get hyperinflation, that's a mentality where people start to panic, and they're like, I gotta buy it today before it gets more expensive. I don't see that happening right now. And then the chart on the right, I was given a similar presentation a couple of weeks ago, and I thought the apocalypse of inflation was with us. And that was that Dollar Tree raised their prices from a dollar for some things to a dollar and a quarter to a dollar and 50. And people said they were surprised. And I said, I'm surprised too. I can't believe they waited that long. Because what we've done on that black line is that we went back to 1985 when Dollar Tree came into an existence. And the dollar from 1985 adjusted for inflation is today worth $2.50. So the fact that they raised some things, by the way, not all, to $1.25 to $1.50, I think is a good sign. The fact is they still would have to raise it another dollar just to keep up to where inflation is. But discount retailers like that are one of the things that are keeping prices low, and I think they're going to stay there. Another thing I think is important is that there are a lot of stakeholders out there that have no incentive to change the narration on inflation. Why? Well, first of all, inflation is a big concern. I told you it's the number one question with clients. 93% of consumers 
are either very or somewhat concerned about inflation. So who do you think is getting on top of that? Politicians. It's become a political issue. And although President Biden and Treasury Secretary uh, Yellen have said that this inf infrastructure package is going to lower inflation, the people on Fox aren't trying to change that narrative. They continue to sell the story, and so are a lot of the Republicans. So it is a political story. It's also a media story, right? The media, bad news sells. So people like to see barren, barren shelves, all the ships off the coast of LA and, and Long Beach, right? I gotta tell you, about three weeks ago, I don't wanna give you a feeling, but I'm kind of a boring guy, but I was watching all the morning shows on a Sunday, right? So I watched State of the Union, Meet the Press, and then Face the Nation. All three of those shows had a reporter interviewing the crews on the boats out on, off the West Coast, right? Why? Because if you think back to three weeks ago, there was nobody in Washington. They were on their fall break. They needed something to sell. Bad news sells. And then the other point I would make to you is that there's not a CEO in America that really wants to change the narrative, especially retailers. Why? Because if they tell you that there's gonna be shortages and that prices are going to, things are gonna be hard to get, what do you tend to do? You buy things earlier. And when you buy things earlier, you pay more or less. You tend to pay a little bit more, right? And by the way, studies show when you start earlier for your holiday shopping season, you tend to shop a lot longer and then you buy a lot more. So why would you want to change that narrative? And by the way, do not get bought, don't get fooled by some of these things where some of these big retailers say, Hey, if you buy the good today and it gets cheaper 40 days from now going into the holiday, you can get the rebate. You can apply for a rebate and get a, uh, your, your money, part of your money back. They've done the study. How many people really do that? Anybody in here do that? Seriously, anybody? Because if you are, kudos to you because you're a great shopper because I can't even find my receipt once I walk out of the store, right? Now, to the supply chain. Those supply chain constraints are for real and they are expected. When you open a global economy simultaneously, of course there's going to be some constraints. But I would tell you that they are exaggerated, what you're seeing, okay? And I'm gonna go step by step at the, with the supply chain. But if you look at the import containers and ports, first of all, we have a record amount of containers that have already been built, so we got more containers. If you look at the ports, they are, because of productivity, doing a lot more than they've ever done. And you pick your port, New York, Savannah, Charleston, Long Beach, LA, all of them are doing 20% more containers than they did back in 2019, which was the previous record. So they're doing more activity. And by the way, there's 619 new ships that have been ordered by shippers. Do you know how much one container ship holds? It holds 24,000 containers which if you stack them up side by side, would go 44 miles. That is a lot in those boats. So there's plenty of capacity being built. When you look at the rail and rain planes, rails are doing okay. They're up about 5% versus 2019, but everybody focuses on that. They're not focusing on the fact that air cargo is now up over 20% versus 2019. And that's highlighted by the fact that Amazon now has 85 planes flying all the time trying to get things delivered. Trucks, a lot of people think that's the weak link. Four higher is down 3%. That's the key word though, four higher. That four higher does not include private corporations like the truck drivers for Amazon, Walmart, Costco, Home Depot. When you start to factor all of them in, you get a lot more truckers out there. In fact, uh, Amazon has 50,000 semis and trailers. Walmart has 66,000 of those. They have over 10,000 truck drivers by themselves. So there's a lot more capacity being built in to the trucking industry. And then when you look at warehouse distribution, distribution just this year versus last year, the space that they have to store things is up 24% or 38 million square feet. Forget that number. That's the equivalent of six thousand football fields. If they didn't have the goods, why would you want more storage, right? And then when you look at the bottom line, when you look at retailers and how we get things to our house, we're still averaging about 150 packages per household being delivered per year. And yesterday on 
meet the press, they had uh, Fred, Fred Smith, the CEO of uh, FedEx. He thinks that FedEx is going to deliver 100 million packages more this holiday shopping season than they did back in 2019. And when you look at the retailer's revenues, and that's the big five, that is Amazon, Walmart, Costco, Target, and Home Depot, their revenues are up 50% since 2019, 50%. So obviously they're delivering goods. So I, my, my expectation is that because of these productivity gains, because of all this increased capacity, you are eventually going to see a glut and you're going to actually see cheaper expenses because of the supply chain, because they're building in so much capacity. And by the way, you know all those ships that are sitting off the coast of California? If they don't get unloaded, how much do you think those goods and those ships are going to be selling for next year? Not very much. They're not going to be at a premium. And by the way, premium pricing historically doesn't last that long. If you look, if you look at the top of here, premium pricing, we all saw it during the pandemic, right? A Peloton cost $2,300. Today, you can get one for $1,495. Everyone saw the big surge in lumber prices, right? Because the mills were temporarily closed. Went up to $1,700. You had people talking about $2,000, $2,500. Well, it turned the other way. Lumber's back down to $700. And then you are already seeing a lot of those shipping prices starting to come down on the far right chart there as well. And then when you look at the reopening trade, we had told people you were going to see high prices during the summer, right? That shouldn't be a shock that all of us came out of hibernation at the same time and wanted to do the same thing. So that's why you saw hotel prices going higher. That's why you saw rental cars going higher. That's why you saw airfares going higher. But look at all of them right now they're all slowly starting to roll over as we do things at different times and we normalize our holiday seasons. So the bottom line when it comes to the economy is, as opposed to a lot of the negative that you hear in the news, I think we're setting up for more of a Goldilocks scenario in the sense that we think GDP growth is going to be solid, about double what is considered a good year at around 3.5%. The unemployment rate is going to continue to trend lower, closer to 4%, and... I believe that inflationary pressures are going to ease as we go into next year. When it comes to the Fed, I think the Fed is going to remain on hold until 2023. The main reason for that is that we still have a lot of work to do to put people back to work. As of Friday, there's still over 4.2 million jobs that we have to rehire to get back to where we were pre-pandemic. And if the inflationary pressures ease, as I expect, that will give the Fed the flexibility to be patient before they actually have to raise rates. Now, when it comes to this whole thing called tapering, right? So the whole thing about tapering is that the Federal Reserve has been buying $120 billion of bonds, okay, per month. And they are now tapering it, which means that they're going to go from 120 down to 105. And by the middle of next year, they're going to be done buying bonds. So a lot of investors are like, oh my goodness, if the Fed's no longer buying those bonds, that's gonna to lead to a decline in the price of bonds because nobody's gonna want them. So let's just do a quick math problem together here. If the Fed is buying $120 billion per month times 12, and then we'll round up, that equals one and a half trillion dollars of bonds they are not going to buy next year. Now on the other side, our government is not going to issue as much debt next year because our deficit for 2022 is going to be $2 trillion less than it was this year. So in essence, the Fed not buying is really because we're not going to be, the government's not going to be issuing as much. In fact, the government issuing is going to issue more, is not going to issue anywhere near as much as what the difference is going to be. So I don't think that's going to have an impact on where interest rates can go. And in fact, I think that interest rates are going to see, stay about where they are for the foreseeable future. Another reason that will keep interest rates lower for longer is the demographics. Right now, if you look at people age 55 and older, there's about 100 million of them. The bigger part of that story is that they own about 70% of the wealth in America. And what happens when you get a little bit older? You tend to want a little bit more conservative portfolio. You want a little bit more income. You tend to want bonds. So that increasing demand from retirees should keep a lid ultimately on where interest rates can go. Why do you own bonds? Well, it's kind of that harness, if you will, for your portfolio. And 
In times of volatility, they can mitigate risk. So if you look up there on the left-hand side, those light blue lines, those are the declines of the S&P 500 in the worst years. So you've seen the S&P 500 down more than 35%, more than 20%, more than 15%. Look at the decline of bonds in the black. Very tiny declines. In fact, some people are surprised by this, but when I tell you this so far year to date, if we were to close the year, this would be the third worst year ever for the bond market. Most people don't realize that, why? Because the equity market's been up 25%. You don't really realize that, right? But what happens on the other side? The chart on the right-hand side shows you when the equity market, the dark, blue, the dark black lines, when it's been down, how have bonds done, the blue? Bonds have been up. And that's the whole point of diversification to help minimize some of the risk of the portfolio. When it comes to the equity market, equity market has continued to go higher. A lot of, there's a saying on Wall Street that the market likes to climb the wall of worry. And I think that happens because there are some misplaced worries out there. As I mentioned, elevated equity valuations, yes. The PE or the multiple of the equity market is elevated. But the reality is that it's still very attractive when you, can, when you compare it to the bond market. When you look at peak earnings growth, yes, we're probably past the peak. We're not going to grow 45%. Next year, it's going to be 10. But as I told you, 10 is still above the historical average. And then some people fear, you've probably seen these headlines, rising rates are going to kill the bull market. Well, what's happened this year? The 10-year Treasury yield began the year at 0.9%. Today, it's at about 1.5, 1.6%. So yields have gone higher, but the market's gone higher too. So don't necessarily get into the headlines that you hear. As long as the economy is doing better, that's what really drives the equity market. Three reasons why we like the equity market to continue its rally. Number one, it's early in its tenure. This current bull market's only about one and a half years in the making. Historically, it lasts about six years. Second, the economy on the left-hand side, when GDP growth is between 2 and 4%, the market tends to be higher on average by about 10%, and it's up 80% of the time. And that makes sense, right? If you have a good economy, it drives earnings. And then earnings, we think, will continue to be positive. One caveat that I would tell you, we think that earnings are going to grow 10%, but in that number, we factored in the corporate tax rate going up to 25%. That looks as if that is off the table down in Washington. If that ultimately becomes the case, that means that there is upside risk to our earnings forecast, which means that there's upside risk to our S&P 500 target of 4,900 by the end of next year. The sectors that we like and favor right now are called the cyclical sectors in that brown shading. We like consumer discretionary, financials, communication services, energy, and industrials. The reason why is when you look at the chart on the right, that's where the best earnings growth is going to be next year. You want to be in those sectors that have the best earnings growth. And by the way, they have some strong thematic backing behind them. Communication services should continue to do well as people do more and more streaming. And you got the rollout of 5G. When it comes to consumer discretionary, I showed you how much spending power the consumer is going to have over the next 12 months. When it comes to financials, that's one of the cheapest sectors out there, and it should continue to reap the benefits of a strong capital market uh, dynamic. And then when it comes to industrials and energy, they should continue to reap the benefits of the infrastructure projects that are going on down in Washington. Now, one question that I get from a lot of people is technology. And technology has become a huge part of the market. Believe it or not, the top seven stocks of the S&P 500 are now all tech related. So a lot of people now are concerned with the fact that they've gotten so big, they're bound to have a fall from grace. But we don't necessarily think so because tech is not what it was 20 years ago. Tech 20 years ago was like a one trick pony. They either had a hardware or a software product and then they rode that business cycle up and down. And if you look at Apple, it was basically the iMac the laptop, and believe it or not, iTunes, which was with CDs back then, right? But today, look at how diversified they are from a business perspective. Not only do they have the hardware and all the wearables, they are now a semiconductor company as they make their own chips. They have all the software with all their applications that they put out there to include also the cloud and the now arcade that they provide. 
they have, they're a health and fitness company. They're a financial company with you know, Apple Pay and their credit card that they give. And they have Apple TV, and they're actually coming out with some TV programs. So they are completely diversified versus where they once were, which means that they have now more levers to pull. Same thing for Amazon. Back in 20, 2001, they were 100% a consumer discretionary company with selling basically books over the internet. But look today, not only do they sell books, but they have some hardware with Alexa, Ring, and the Kindle. They have all these brands that fall underneath that window, which include Whole Foods, Twitch, and last week it was disclosed that they actually have a 20% ownership in an electric vehicle company. They are getting into the pharmaceutical world with their pill pack. And they, as well, have a big streaming service with plenty of shows that even include the NFL. Oh, and by the way, underneath all of that, they are a huge industrial company with all the transportation and logistics that they provide. So they are completely different, again, than they were in 2001. And I think that that is one of the reasons that continues to support a lot of the size that they now have. When it comes to international, we continue to favor the US over the other developed markets. And the reason for that is that when you look at those statistics on the left-hand side, what you see is that the US companies are, in general, much more efficient, productive, and that leads to better earnings. And if you want to know, look at the earnings over the last 10 years, US companies have almost doubled the earnings of companies in Japan and Europe. And that leads to better performance. By the way, when you invest, we like to invest in the areas where you are the market leaders. And when you look at the chart there on the right-hand side, the top five brands in the world reside here in the United States. 11 of the top 15 brands reside here in the United States. When it comes to the sectors that we like, as I mentioned, I like the cyclical sectors. So when you look at that chart there on the left-hand side, you would see that small cap, which is the Russell 2000, and international, which is EFI, both have a lot of cyclical exposure. But to me, the question is, do I, would I rather be in small cap stocks or international stocks? And my preference would be to next go to small cap stocks. Why? When you look at earnings on the right-hand side, that dark blue line is the earnings for, the, for small cap stocks. They are far superior than the TAN, which is the international stocks. The other reason is that if you look at the economy, I think the US economy is much more resilient. Energy is driving gasoline prices higher. Just know that while energy, gasoline prices have gone higher here, they're around 320 to 330 per gallon. Over in Japan, it's $2 more per gallon. Over in Europe, it's two to three times more expensive. Why is that important? Because as energy prices and gasoline prices go higher, that tends to eat away at what the consumer can actually buy and that tends to slow an economy down. The other thing we have to watch for is the fact that if energy prices continue to go higher, that's going to lead to inflation. And if you look at the middle chart, inflation in Germany is the highest it's been in decades. That could cause the central bank there to come in and prematurely raise interest rates. For commodities, I would just tell you that we think that, that oil is going to go to about $75 per barrel over the next 12 months. So far, it's, what's driven it has been the surge in demand, but I think you're about to see a surge in the supply response. And probably the best chart to show you that's the one there on the left-hand side. Coming into this year, the price of oil was around $50 per barrel. Well, that's about what the break-even is when you're drilling for new oil. So there's not a lot of incentive. But now that oil is $30 higher, there's a lot more incentive for those oil producers to produce oil. So I think you're going to see now a supply increase. And when you increase the supply of something, it tends to tamp down ultimately where the price can go. When it comes to asset allocation, I think it's important to always have a plan. And in fact, getting back to our whole theme here about being at the peak and climbing, I think there are a lot of parallels between having a pre-climbing check and investing. When you do a pre-climb, you want to visualize what your goals are. Just like when you're investing, you want to make sure you identify your goals and objectives to know what do I want to do with this portfolio, right? You want to know where you want to go with it. When you do a pre-climbing checklist, you want to improve your conditioning so you know how much risk you can take on the slopes. That's what you want to do 
with your portfolio. Determine how much risk you can actually take on a daily, weekly, monthly, quarterly, and investment cycle. You want to pack for inclement weather in case something unforeseen happens. That's what you want to do for your portfolio as well. Know what you're going to do when volatility hits. And probably the best example that I can give you was last year when the S&P 500 fell during the pandemic. If you would have panicked and sold out of the market during those dark days, you would have missed out on the over 100% rally that we've had from those times. So making sure you have a plan in effect is very important. And then you want to always evaluate the best route when you're climbing, just like you should always periodically review your portfolio to make sure you are on course to accomplish all of your goals and objectives. And if not, that's when you determine an alternative route. During that survey that we do, we did something that's called a word cloud. So we gave all of our, all, everybody that, that went into our survey all of these words, and you had to put them in as either most important, important, or not important. And a word cloud, basically, the size is reflective of the responses. So if you said most important more times, the size of the words are bigger. If you didn't think it was important, it wasn't. This is the result, and you see what the biggest words were that were most important to investors. They were time horizon, risk tolerance, diversification, and asset allocation. Those are the forces of asset allocation and which we believe over time really lead to successful investing. What's not that big? Market timing. Nobody's great at market timing, right? Having a long-term strategy is much more important. And then the focus on just one of those topics, time horizon, there's an example up there of the daily movements of the S&P 500. Green is up, red is down. And when you look at that, can you tell over the last five years, has the S&P 500 been up or down? Most people really aren't that sure, right? Because it looks fairly even. When you look at it on a monthly basis, you're like, well, I think it's probably skewed to the upside because I'm starting to see more green months than red down months. When I look at it on a quarterly basis, I think it's pretty solid bet that the market has been higher over that time period. But then when I pan all the way back and look at it from a cumulative basis over the last five years, the S&P 500 has doubled, it's been up 100%, and it's been up at an annualized pace of almost 15%. So the point of this is that you want to avoid the avalanche of all the headlines that you see, all the wiggles in the market, and take a longer term approach to investing because that's where most successful investors ultimately end up being. And then I'm gonna conclude and I got two more points that I wanna mention and in a second, I'm going to put up another logo and I want you to yell out when you know what that logo is, okay? No guesses yet? It is Superman. So the, so the reason I did that is in this market, I think I heard Superman over here, right? I think I heard it first over here. The reason I did that is because in investing, you need to identify the trends first, right? That's where you get rewarded, when you identify the trends first. If you wait until everybody sees the trends, it's too late. It's already been priced into the market. So as your reward for getting it first, there's your, who got, I don't know if I can throw it that far, but. <laughs> I'll try. <laughs> oh my God. Somebody told me I should put a rubber band around. Anyway, so that's the one point. Make sure you're first when it comes to that. And the second thing, does anybody in here know what the S stands for? How many people in here think it stands for Superman? Raise your hand. How many people in here think it stands for Supergirl? Raise your hand. How many people think it stands for saving lives? Raise your hand. Well, believe it or not, it doesn't stand for any of those. It actually represents the crest of the House of L, 
which is the family from which both Superman and Supergirl come from. And it represents a motto called El Mayora, which translated means hope and stronger together. And that's exactly what all of us have done over the last 20 months. We've been stronger together, and we're gonna to continue to be stronger together to continue to thrive and get over anything that comes in front of us. And with that, you guys have been fantastic. Thank you very much, and have a great rest of your conference. Thanks, Larry. If you don't mind, Larry, time for a question? Oh, I thought, oh. Yeah, so just letting everybody know, our next speaker is um, going to be joining us virtually, so via Zoom. So we're monitoring when he jumps on in the back. So we've got a few minutes until he jumps on. So I know you always have questions. So we'll take a couple while we have time, if you don't mind, Larry. Yeah, absolutely. So, Larry, you mentioned there's 4.2 million jobs to hire. Where are they? <laughs> so, so I'm, I'm going to ta take two sides of that. Okay, so there's a lot of jobs opening in a lot of the service part of the industries that we see, right? So restaurants, hotels, healthcare facilities. You know, you do see a lot of jobs in the trucking world, et cetera. The one point that I would mention to you, though, on a more serious note, is that you see the big headlines that there are over 10 million jobs available. I would tell you to be careful that I think that potentially that could be exaggerated to the upside. And the reason I think that is that companies right now are having a hard time finding people for these jobs. Do you think companies are just sitting idly by, just waiting for people to come knock on their door to work? No. So what are companies doing right now? They are employing everything and everything they can for technology solutions. And if you don't think technology can replace a lot of those jobs, you're mistaken. I mean, just think about when you go to the store and you look at cashiers. Think about when you go to banks, tellers. Think about when you go to some of these restaurants now, fast food, you got kiosk. Think about the warehouses where you have a lot more technology being done. Think about when you go to a hospital right now and you have patient portals as opposed to talking to, a, to an individual about the status. So my point is, that they're not waiting, and I don't know if you saw the news this morning, Amazon, behind the scenes for, for a while now, has been having driverless trucks out in Silicon Valley. So I think that's the next area you could see more in it. So my point is that there might be some jobs that are out there, and particularly in warehouses and restaurants, but I don't know, I, the, the, the longer it takes to fill those jobs, I think they could potentially disappear. All right, we have time for one more. Just your um, thoughts about the debt, that's always a huge issue. Some people say debt doesn't matter, and other people like it's the next crushing, looming thing. I just, you know, your, your couple comments about what you think uh, the debt is in this country and the future and how we handle it. So I absolutely think that debt matters. Um, if anybody knows, that, that number just went above $30 trillion, which is a tremendous amount of money. Um, I would tell you, though, that what shocks a lot of people is the fact the amount of money that we pay uh, as a percentage of our outlays from the government is actually at the lowest level to pay for that debt. So the amount of money that we pay in interest payments as a percentage of the outlays of our, of our government, it's the lowest level since 1945. People are shocked by that, right? And the reason it's that low is because we've been able to refinance debt and the new debt we've been taking has basically very low interest payments. So when does it become a problem? When interest rates rise. And I gotta tell you, that's the little dirty secret down in Washington, that rates really can't rise. Because if they do, not only will it hurt consumers and businesses, it could crush the, the, the budget down there because we'll have to pay more and more of the budget on interest payments than we do on obviously more important things, right? Healthcare, education, infrastructure, those types of things. So it's not a problem right now as long as rates stay low, but you gotta keep a close eye on it. All right. Thank you very much, Larry. Thanks for coming and joining us Thank today. you, guys. Enjoy your conference.